Hello and welcome to Getaway Day. My name is Gautam and today I'll be flying solo. Mason is out. We've got a lot to cover today and we're going to start out with Major League Baseball's announcement on Wednesday. The results of a newly integrated statistical database which covers the records from the Negro Leagues that operated from 1920 to 1948. This is several years after the Negro Leagues were recognized as a major league in um, December 2020. Today, we have MLB.com uh, record books, a huge shakeup across all types of statistical categories. Obviously, baseball is strongly tied to the numbers and record holders, and some of the leaders are different people now, and there's just a whole bunch of stuff that we can dig into. Obviously, um, can't do that in full form today, but I thought I'd just hit on some of the interesting guys that really pop off the page. Josh Gibson is now the leader in several many um, statistical categories, including uh, being recognized now as the hits leader, hit hitting leader with the highest all-time batting average at 372, surpassing uh, Ty Cobb. He's also got the highest OPS and highest slugging percentage in history. So there's a lot to unpack here with this uh, decision made by Major League Baseball to include uh, Negro League statistics in with American League and National League statistics that have, have been held uh, separate for forever. And Major League Baseball did a very, very good job of collecting this data, and, and they got help from several statistical sources, including one called Seam Heads. There's some uh, discussion about how this data would actually be used, and just to give you a little bit more on how they actually found all this stuff that happened, you know, 100 years ago, and... Um, you know, more than 75 years after uh, Jackie Robinson was the first player to play in the National League, who was uh, black. So they went through and by hand, essentially, they collected box score data from the Negro Leagues um, for games that counted towards Negro League standings which was a 60-game schedule. Typically, some seasons it was less, some seasons it was a little bit more. But truly, uh, Negro League players played something like 150 to 175 games a year. They were playing multiple games a day at times in, in all cities, but only a subset of those games were actually counted as official games. The other thing uh, for this record-keeping only games where box scores were available were actually counted as part of um, this new statistical database that we have today. So you could go back and maybe find some newspaper clippings of a game story where Josh Gibson was said to have hit four home runs in a game. Unfortunately, some of those while they're probably true, it probably did happen like that. Since there was no box score recorded, that's a game that's not part of this record. And uh, Major League Baseball and their uh, partners in this huge undertaking have basically stated that they've been able to recover 75% of all Negro League's box scores. And as more become available, as they parse through all this um, very uh, difficult data to, to process and, and make sure that they, that they get things right, um, they'll, they'll continue to add to what we have today. I think that the number one thing behind this is that we have to recognize these players that were legends of their time, the Josh Gibsons, the Turkey Stearns, I mean, that name's awesome. Uh, Oscar Charleston, I mean, these are guys that are popping up now 
in the top 10 in, in batting average all time. These guys are, these guys should be recognized um, amongst the greats in, in baseball history. There's no question about that. Um, but obviously, it's hard to compare the Negro Leagues and the American National League because um, levels of competition were so different. We'll never know what things would have looked like if Josh Gibson was a player in the American League, for example. And, and that's okay. So there's limitations of combining the two statistical uh, leagues together. And we see that in some of the, some of the numbers here, like Josh Gibson has uh, in his line here in his career line in 653 games uh, that are counted here. It says he only struck out 11 times. That's obviously not true. So, and that's okay. Like there, there's going to be stuff that's not a hundred percent accurate, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't matter or it doesn't count or, or whatever. Like these are, um, we just got to like understand those limitations when we try to make comparisons. Cause, cause that's what people are going to be up in arms about that. You know, Josh Gibson's not, not the, not the true average King because he, uh, didn't play in MLB, for example, but I don't think that's necessarily what the point of this is. I think the idea is just that we give these players who were playing in the best and uh, most prestigious league they were allowed due to the limitations of Major League Baseball, um, their, their due. Um so there, there actually is precedent for verifying seasons as th- that are less than the n- normal number of games um, as recently as 2020 during the COVID pandemic season where there was a 60 game schedule. Those, those games all count and, you know, they're part of the record books and that's kind of exactly how these Negro League seasons have been verified here um they've also implemented statistical minimums for the leaders just like they do in the american national league and it's the same markers just for different um different numbers of total games so 3.1 plate appearances or one inning pitched per scheduled team game so in our 162 game schedule that means that um, you know, 502 plate appearances or 162 innings. Those are those are the the markers we have today. But you just scale that down to 60 games played, and you you've got different thresholds to be qualified and show up on these as as the leaders. Uh, so like single season batting average, Josh Gibson hit 466 in 1943. Chino Smith 451 in 1929. Um, so some some mind-boggling numbers, uh, but you know obviously baseball has changed a whole lot, and um, we have to recognize those uh, those eras of of our sport, even if they didn't take place like in nice tidy National and American League uh, record keeping that. Uh, that has existed for a long time. So it's a, it's a cool movement. I'm really looking forward to digging into some of the intricacies of it and just trying to actually learn some history. You know, I, I don't know all the guys that are showing up in this list. I haven't even heard of some of them and they were the, some of the greatest players of their time. And that's worth learning about. That's worth remembering. And I'm, that, that's, that's the way I'm going to um, approach this announcement. I think it's very, very cool uh, for our sport, and I hope that people will appreciate it. Um, moving along, uh, we've got some some big-time players 
doing big time things in the month of May. Uh, these are guys that kind of got off to slow starts, but they are they're the superstars of today. And those three guys, um, Aaron Judge, Jose Ramirez, and Corey Seager. Uh, so I'll start with Ramirez, actually. So Ramirez is having some kind of month. He is batting um, 296 in the month of May. He's hit 11 home runs, um, scored 22 runs, 32 RBI, uh, four stolen bases in just 98 at-bats. So unreal production from Jose Ramirez. Uh, he got the bonds treatment the other day, getting walked with the bases loaded intentionally to drive in a run. Um, I guess with Jose, sometimes he just gets on these ridiculous streaks and he's unstoppable. And it looks like this is not going to be the year that um, he's going to be slowed down. Like he's been the guy that we've come to know and love for, for so many years with Cleveland and a guy that I've been following forever because his career just seems so unlikely when you uh, consider he was kind of a afterthought prospect, broke onto the scene, and, and then he's turned himself into an absolute superstar. Like maybe he's on the Hall of Fame track for all we know. And he's been a huge part of, of Cleveland's major success this year uh, alongside Josh Naylor, David Fry, probably the unlikeliest uh, performance of the season to date. But enjoy, enjoy Jose Ramirez. Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge is incredible. He now leads the league in OPS, uh, over 1,000. And for me, Judge is, is pretty much a must-watch at bat. He, he's just such an imposing figure in the box with his, his size. And uh, you just feel like he's going to do something good in every at bat. And he, he has long at bats. He, he makes the pitcher work. Obviously, the pitcher knows his presence, and uh, they are doing everything they possibly can to work around him. Yet, the guy's slugging a thousand on first pitches. It's like the pitchers not realize that he's going out there to to swing at first pitches and and do some major damage. Like Aaron Judge doesn't really have a, a two strike approach. I would say like he he's getting his a swing off all the time as much as he can. Uh, for pitches that are anywhere near the strike zone. Um, and he's done that damage this month. And the Yankees middle of their lineup, unbelievable, with Juan Soto, Aaron Judge, and Giancarlo Stanton back, batting back-to-back-to-back. To back to back. They went back-to-back-to-back to back to back in home runs off Hugh Darvish uh, over the weekend. And by the third home run, I mean, you. <laughs> Yu's face was just dejected. He he couldn't believe it, even though uh, we're talking about three very powerful big bats. If the Yankees keep this up, they they're the team to beat in the national in the American League, um, with surprising pitching performances from some of their younger guys like Luis Heel, Clark Schmidt. Um, the offense looks like a force to be reckoned with. If they get uh, Garrett Cole back, they're going to be in really, really good shape um, as we head into the middle part of the season. And then the final guy, uh, Corey Seager. Guy, in my opinion, is top five uh, pure hitter in the game. And when I say pure hitter, I'm not just talking about a guy who hits for average. He is a premium source a batting average. He's been that his whole career, but I'm talking about just a complete hitter, a guy that uh, has patience at the plate, but is still selectively aggressive. Guy who likes to swing early in counts, uh, does damage, hits for power. Um, he's had some years though, where he's had stretches where he didn't hit for power or 
he was not hitting for average. And and sometimes like all the pieces don't come together at the same time, but when they all do come to the come together at the same time as they did last year, and as we've seen in this most recent stretch, uh, it's a sight to behold because he's unstoppable. Corey Seager has eight home runs over his last eight games played. Uh, I think he's up to 10 home runs. Uh, I don't have that pulled up right now, but uh, I think at least uh, 10 home runs in the month of uh, May. Uh, Let me just check that. Yep, 10 home runs in the month of May. Uh, I think he had another one today on the 29th. Corey Seager is um, trying his best to keep Texas uh, relevant in in the uh, NL West, which is just in general got off to a very slow start with Seattle actually leading right now, but not looking like a team that should be winning a division. I mean, Texas is a few games under 500, uh, dealing with several injuries and um, kind of some slow starts and an underperformance from some of their perceived key players. And then obviously Houston hasn't played up to their potential. But if Seager plays like this, I think um, he's a guy that can carry a team for stretches. And um, the supporting cast is very good. It's not like um, he'd have to do everything. As long as guys you know, play relatively similarly to what, what they're expected to do and Seager plays at his his MVP level, then that lineup is um is gonna prop up this team and they can they can make a they can make a push and, and a run at the playoffs once again. Uh so yeah, those are just three players that they're stars. I guess I didn't say anything probably that was shocking in there. But in a year where offense has been so hard to come by, and those guys got up, got got off to pretty slow starts, um, they weren't going to be held down forever and and for long. So they're they're doing their things, and it feels especially important in in this specific year. And I think that's something that we're going to talk about in the coming weeks with um, some historically low offensive performances just league-wide in the month of May. Okay, we got big news in the uh, umpiring realm. Angel Hernandez, probably the most, um, the, one of the most discussed umpires. I'll, I'll just start with that. He's a guy that is known for egregiously bad calls. And the numbers say Angel Hernandez was not the worst umpire in the league. He was, he was, pretty close to the bottom in terms of like making correct strike and ball calls. But when he would make a miss, it would be something that it was hard to fathom, like how this would happen. I mean, I'm not saying that he did it on purpose. He might've just been a a kind of bad umpire, but for whatever reason, he was a guy that was really easy for fans, players, managers to, to latch onto and it was kind of due to his lack of uh of thick skin like he he was easily um kind of disturbed and had no trouble throwing guys out for for basically saying anything for getting in his way and he became a show in himself and and, and not a good one like no one wants to see angel hernandez throwing out like a like a star, like a Bryce Harper from a game, just because he felt like it that day. I mean, that's what it felt like sometimes when when Angel was doing his thing. And I don't think the baseball community is really going to miss Angel Hernandez. And it's noteworthy that we're actually talking about an umpire retiring, because usually that's something that just doesn't get discussed unless it's like a Joe West who umpired for like 50 years. It, it's it's unfortunate that he got this much negative attention. I'm sure he didn't deserve all of it. Umpires have a hard job. They have a thankless job. They have a job that 
um, that really, um, to be honest, like they do a way better job than, than the fans and probably the players give them credit for probably because, uh, we have these tracking te- techniques to show us, oh yeah, he missed this call. He, he missed this call by this many inches and this and that. But the fact of the matter is some of those, uh, public metrics that are available now, like you go on Twitter, you can find the um- umpire scorecard. You can find several other alternatives to that, that show, Hey, these guys are doing a great job and, um, they really don't make that many mistakes. We just see the box on the screen that shows that the pitch was outside and like to get frustrated about something. Um, so I guess I'll be the one to say, you know, <laughs> congratulations to Angel Hernandez for retiring. I mean, he's been doing it at the major league level since 1991. So 30 plus years on the job. It's, it's time, it's time to move on at some point, you know, good for him. Like he's retired now. He can, he can do what he wants and hope he, hope he enjoys that. Um, another guy who might be looking at some, some time off pretty soon is the White Sox manager, Pedro Griffol, who went off on his team the other day. Um, he had a, he had quite the quote, um, after a 4-1 loss to the Orioles, which was the end of another sweep uh, at the hands of yeah, the Orioles, White Sox are now 15-41. and 41. Um, He called most of his hitters bleeping flat today, unacceptable. And then he also called a meeting to express his displeasure to the team. Uh, the team did not take too kindly to this. Corey Lee, catcher on the White Sox, says he's going to feel that way, and obviously we have a different feeling. He's entitled to his own opinion also. I think that's a valid reason. It's nothing to hide about that. He has his opinions, and now, and everyone is going to have their own opinions. So, to me, that's that's Corey Lee not agreeing with what uh, Pedro Grifola is saying, and this is, in my opinion, just a guy that's extremely frustrated with, with this situation in an organization like the White Sox that has not done well at supporting players, managers, coaches, whatever the case is. And I'd be frustrated, too, if my team had won 15 games um, as we approach June in the season. I mean, they've been really, really bad. Um it the other thing is he's a professional and I'm not sure that a public call out is something that plays well in a major league clubhouse with professional baseball players. And that that's um I think the writing's on the wall for, for Mr. Griffol. I think his time as manager is probably over. There's no real judging his uh like his talent as a manager based on the situation he was given but I can say that he's not doing the best job handling the situation from like a, um like a human relations type perspective like the the players I don't think are appreciative of of the public call out if if you do it in private it's one thing doing it in public is is a totally different thing and we've talked about this before with uh ollie marmol with with uh, tyler o'neill last year and i i thought marmol might get himself fired and and he didn't so maybe Griffol's safe but usually not a good sign when when you're calling out your own players um probably the biggest injury that we've uh, seen this season, the reigning MVP, Ronald Acuna Jr., tore his left ACL um, on a stolen base attempt. He just uh, totally collapsed to the ground and was kind of in some major pain, as as one is after an ACL injury. 
this is just brutal news for the Braves, for baseball, for for him especially, for, for a guy that has already come back from one ACL tear in 2021 to have to now go through it again uh, on his other leg. It's, it's incredibly sad news. And for the Braves, they're now without Spencer Strider and they're without Ronald Acuna. So they've lost their best pitcher. They've lost their best hitter. It's, it's tough, but this team may be um, equipped to handle it and, and maybe they'll make some, some uh, midseason moves to kind of fill in the gaps. You can't replace Ronald Acuna, but you just have to look back to what happened in 2021. They go out and they trade for Eddie Rosario, Jorge Soler, Doc Peterson. Um, those guys, you know, got hot at the right time and they filled the void, the massive, massive void, void of Ronald Acuna, and they, they won the World Series that year. Um, this year, I do see kind of a depth issue with this club. I don't think they have the internal replacements. Uh, Jared Kelnick, Adam Duvall are going to play larger roles this year with um, with Acuna out. Maybe they go out and they trade for another outfielder, but um, it's going to be tough, and especially with, with the Phillies, playing as well as they have. I would say that the Braves are not the team to beat in that division anymore. Despite being a very good team, they're they're no question going to be in the race. They're probably going to make the playoffs. But um, it's just all the more difficult with, with Acuna out. And then selfishly, as a baseball fan, like you hate to see these type of guys get injured because – of what it kind of means from a historical perspective. Like Acuna is a guy that debuted so young as a 20 year old. And now he's lost two major chunks of two of the prime years of his career that it's always going to be kind of like a, what could have been with him, even if he comes back and, and becomes um, a superstar again. He will have missed major time in his career that might prevent him from reaching certain statistical thresholds that uh, could factor into like a Hall of Fame case, for example. Um, how about the week by the San Francisco Giants? I mean, if you're a Giants fan, like cardiac Giants, unbelievable stuff. Uh, Going back to Wednesday, May 15th, the Giants have won. Um, I'll just take you through their games here real quick. So they finished, there was the last game of a three game set against the Dodgers. They'd lost the first two games. They beat the Dodgers to close out that series. Uh, then they sweep the Rockies at home uh, pretty handily with a 10 5 win, 14 4 win, 4 1 win. Um, then they played a kind of crazy game started by Paul Skeens against the Pirates in Pittsburgh, where they were up big, and then they ended up getting walked off on um, in the 10th inning. So they lost that one. Then the next four games are really the ones that are key here because they came back in, in four straight ball games, um, And we're talking about big deficits. So on the 22nd, they were down 5 nothing against the Giants. They, they slowly clawed their way back, and then the 10th inning, um, ninth inning, they tied the game. 10th inning, they hit a, they score four more runs. They win the game 9-5. Um, next night, still against the Pirates, um, they're, they're down 5-1 uh, in the middle innings. They end up um, scoring five runs in the eighth inning, and that's off a... Uh, a massive uh, Matt Chapman two-run homer to deep center um, to give him a lead, and, and they held on to win that game. Next night, uh, once again, they're down against the Mets this time. They're down 5-2. Five, uh, five they score five runs in the eighth inning. Once again, this time, a Patrick Bailey grand slam off Reed Garrett. 
to uh, give them a, a big another come come from behind win. Um, the next night they didn't really have a, a huge comeback that night, but they ended up uh, coming from from a small deficit, tying the game in the ninth, and then scoring five more runs in the tenth to to break that game open and and win once again. Um, basically, since May fifteenth, they've only lost two games. That walk off loss against the Pirates. And then another walk-off loss against the Mets on the 26th. So, unbelievably hot team right now, the Giants. Um, I am incredibly encouraged for once, and I have positive things to say about what they're doing, because I've always been kind of skeptical of the approach that they've taken. I, I never felt like they had the talent coming through, especially young talent. And now they are heavily relying on young players in prominent roles, specifically Luis Matos, Elliot Ramos, Patrick Bailey, and Marco Luciano, young shortstop. They all have their flaws. They're all going to struggle at times. Guy like Luciano, clearly not major league shortstop. Um, defensively yet but the bat looks like it's kind of there like he's played well in in his short stint in the majors in this time um you know he's hitting 391 he's got a 462 OVP uh that's in very limited plate appearances but Patrick Bailey hitting the ball extremely hard hitting 299 um making strides off uh promising but kind of unspectacular offensive rookie season. And then they're getting help from their typical veterans like Lamont Wade. Matt Chapman's looking like a great signing. During this streak of winning, Matt Chapman had an, what I find so cool, a defensive walk-off play where he just made this unbelievable play that I really think he's the only guy in the league that could have made this play. Um, kind of moving towards the line at third base, just throwing way across the diamond to uh, get the runner to seal a seal a win. I think that was a game against the Mets. Um, I think there's, there's opportunity in the National League, in the NL West even, to hang with the Dodgers for a little bit and, and make a run at the wild card because other teams that are in the wild card race have struggled to this point, like the Cubs, the Diamondbacks. The Padres are kind of hanging around 500. Um, it's going to be it's going to be a dogfight, I think, in the National League. But the Giants kind of are standing out to me right now as a team that might kind of rise to the top. If I were to guess, I think they can be one of the, the three wild cards this year. And then finally, uh, the Royals and the Guardians. The Royals and the Guardians are in some kind of a race right now for the AL Central. And, and if you had told me that at the beginning of the season, I wouldn't have been shocked by it. But it's happening at such a different level than what people said preseason. Because Royals made a bunch of moves. They had some exciting young players. But I'm, I'm a serial box score checker. And over the last couple of weeks, I keep checking Royals games and the Royals have scored eight runs. They've scored seven runs. They've scored nine runs and, and they're blowing out opponents. Um, obviously they've got their superstar in Bobby Witt, but breakouts from Michael Garcia resurgence from Sal Perez that we talked about last week, their pitching has been the biggest surprise for a team that never seemed like they could figure out a thing on the pitching side. They've got really great performances from Seth Lugo. Um, Brady Singer's bounced back this year. It's been really cool to watch. Um, I will say that I was down on the on the Royals because I didn't think that their moves moved the needle in the offseason, bringing in guys like Adam Frazier, uh, Seth Lugo, Michael Waka. Uh, Hunter Renfro. Renfro and 
and um, and Frazier. Those guys, I was absolutely right. They've been really bad, and they haven't. I wouldn't even say that. Yeah, they just really haven't contributed positively to the team. However, they've got such such a nice uh, core of players, especially on the offensive side. Like, I really like what Michael Massey was doing before he went on the IL recently. Um, Vinny Pasquantino has shown flashes of being uh, an awesome first baseman hitter. The pitching, though, Waka and and Lugo especially, they've been huge for, for that group. I think um, right now they're, they're a team that's surging, and uh, they're, they're the classic example of a team that gets there one year before you think that they're going to. On the other hand, Cleveland um, has been setting the pace. They've got the best record in the American League today. And I kind of mentioned it up top when I was talking about Jose Ramirez. Their offense has been the surprise here because they were a team that did not slug. They were just slap hitters, uh, high contact, but no power. And this year they're hitting for more power. They've almost reached half their home run total from last year in a third of the season. Um, Very strong bullpen. They've won every single game that they've had a lead heading into the ninth inning behind Emmanuel Classe, their lockdown closer. They've only lost one game all year after the sixth inning in a game that they were leading. Those are just the things that good teams do that have good bullpens. Um, There might be some, some staying power here with the Guardians. I think they've got to be considered the team to beat in that division going forward. But uh, shouldn't count out the Royals or the Twins for that matter. But they're they've kind of dragged in the second half of uh, May. So I think that's all I've got for you this week. Uh, hope you didn't mind uh, missing Mason. I missed him, but uh, hopefully you got what you needed out of this one. And we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe on your favorite podcasting app and YouTube to make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Join the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Getaway Day Pod. If you enjoy card collecting, check out our sister YouTube channel at Getaway Day Cards.